When I was young, I was in love with love. I didn't exactly understand what love was until I was much older, only truly able to apprehend its most pronounced and exposed faces. But I knew that I had fallen head over heels with whatever I could grasp of it. I would fantasize, sometimes for hours, about the sorts of grand, romantic gestures that I would produce someday whenever my Annie, or my Lisa, or my Roxanne finally came along. Whether it was stealing an Edelweiss away from far-flung mountains, gifting illustrious libraries, composing immaculate ballads, or sculpting elegant statues in their name, I ran through every one, in every possible composition and context I could imagine, endlessly. Ever hopeful for what the future held, ever naive to its realities. But to me, there is one gesture of love, one expression of affection, that has always reigned above all the other grandiose and magnificent means that humanity, in our short time here on our pale blue dot, has conceived to convey our tenderness for each other. Running. This is always my favorite moment in every romance. Somewhere in the last 10 minutes of its runtime, after we've accompanied our characters through the build-up, payoff, and premature destruction of their enchantment, when as they go their separate ways and begin to submit to the notion that maybe they were never meant, or maybe now just wasn't the right time, one rejects it. And in an instant, they take flight in pursuit of the other, knowing that no amount of books or bouquets or bassoons can bring back their love now. Only their heart kept with them, hastening every step with as quick a pace as they can muster across any street or city or sea that lies between them, they run. More than just my favorite gesture within romance films, this is one of my favorite actions in storytelling in general. Their pursuits, to me, have always been the brightest and most luminescent declaration that cinema can offer that our dreams and our love are the only things in this life truly worth running after. <sighs> Enchanting as these moments are, though, they seldom last longer than a few minutes, and they've always left me with a sense of longing. The pursuit comes to an end, our lovers kiss, the music swells, and the credits roll, but what if they didn't have to? What if this window of time, this immeasurable wave of adoration and sincerity could be ridden forever? Eternal recurrence, meet Millennium Actress. Baby, Okay, before we get into the who's, what's, and why's of what makes Millennium Actress tick, I gotta hit you with a hot and ready recap of the previous EP to make sure viewers old and new are on the same page. Here we go. There was a well-known Greek philosopher who lived about 400 years before Christ, and he went by the name of Empedocles. Among other things, Empedocles proposed what came to be known as the theory of the elements, and the abridged version of it goes a little something like this. There are two forces in our universe, love and strife, existing in an eternal cosmic struggle between each other, causing the four elements, water, air, earth, and fire, to coalesce and separate from one another, creating life and everything within it. Empedocles divided this endless conflict between love and strife into a cycle of four parts, the possession of love, the loss of love, the absence of love and the pursuit of love. And here's where Cohn enters the picture. Satoshi Cohn is the only director I've found whose entire filmography from tip to toe perceives of and deals with the highs and lows of love in the same way Empedocles did. From perfection to paranoia, Empedocles' cycle between love and strife is reflected by every major character and event throughout Cohn's works. And more than any other directors, his works echo the same belief that lies at the center of Empedocles' theory. Love is God. Alright, now that our frame of reference has been reset, it's time to hit play. Following the unexpected 1997 success of Cohn's debut feature, Perfect Blue, he had his sights set on an equally dazzling and reality-defying story to adapt into his next feature film. Yasutaka Susui's 1993 award-winning novel, Paprika. Unfortunately for him, and perhaps more fortunate for us though, Rex Entertainment, the distribution company for Perfect Blue, and what Cohn had intended to be the distribution company for his upcoming adaptation, declared bankruptcy and closed its doors before any work could be started 
started on the sophomore film. Without a secure distribution deal, his plans to adapt Susui's novel fell through, and in 1998, Kohn began to create an original screenplay with his Perfect Blue co-writer, Saruki Murai, recanting the life of a tremendously revered Japanese actress through the lens of her greatest admirer. And just as Kohn's collective works would come to exist as a mirror to Empedocles' theory, Millennium Actress quickly became what Kohn and Murai thought of as a mirror to their previous film deciding early on that it was to exist not as a deviation from the story within a story structure and social commentary presented in Perfect Blue, but as a sister to it, persisting ever adjacent, commenting on the same concepts and constructs, but distilling completely inverse conclusions from them. Two sides of the same coin. Uh, speaking of mirrors, and what can be found within a reflection, it's an opportune time to dive into the film itself and talk motifs. Millennium Actress opens with a shot of outer space, a myriad of distant stars persisting in an otherwise empty frame as the camera slowly pans, first introducing us to Earth as a means to establish familiarity before changing its trajectory and dollying back, our moon quickly engulfing the frame, both dwarfing Earth in scale and drawing our focus to a structure on its surface in the shape of a lotus as it begins to flower. A J-cut of the structure's opening mechanisms breaks the gentle hum of isolation we were carried into the film by, and a moment later, we fade to a close-up of the Lotus, now in full bloom. The first lines of dialogue spoken in the film, ones of cheerful thanks and sorrowful goodbyes, introducing us to our protagonist and soon after this, cutting to a man watching these events unfold with us, because this goodbye is the ending of a film. Just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cuts into the film, and Kohn has introduced us to the three most unremitting motifs within Millennium Actress. Reflections, a lotus, and the gaze of unrequited love. Reflections and the longing gaze of a human pining for the comfort of another are what I would argue to be the most consistent motifs throughout Satoshi Kohn's body of work. The utility of a reflection as a visual or narrative motif is as varied as it is striking, but Kohn generally employs them to express one of two meanings. When it's a visual reflection of a character, this almost always means they're questioning their own personality or their grasp on reality. Either the events they've been plunged into or their dissatisfaction with their own behavior has caused them to question their perception of the world around them, or perhaps worse, their perception of themselves. This is frequently used in Perfect Blue to reflect Mima and the rest of the characters' tandem descent into psychosis, and in Tokyo Godfathers, when Jin meets a corporeal reflection of who he'll become if he continues to live the way he has. And when it's a narrative reflection, it's generally meant to express the infinite, an eternal action or dramatic sweep that, without the possession of love, will continue to loop endlessly. The escapism of various characters leading, without exception, to a deeper and more acute pain often accompanied by a visual reflection of that escapism projected onto their surroundings, like in Paranoia Agent, or the first interaction in a screenplay perfectly bookending that screenplay's conclusion, like in Millennium Actress. While Cohn's body of work exists as a mirror to an endless Empyrean play, Millennium Actress exists as its own amaranthine sequence. Its first shots and first words, an endless expanse of stars, a lotus, an exchange between Shioko and Genya followed by a departure, perfectly reflecting its last shots and its last words. The same departure from the same station punctuated by the same hopefulness, juxtaposing the same remorse. Genya, as he transitions between his real self and his film counterpart, gazing longingly at Chiyoko as Chiyoko gazes longingly into the great beyond. Both of them, as well as the man that Chiyoko's following, all beginning their cycle anew in an endless pursuit of love. So we have reflections and the longing gazes often found within them, but to describe Cohn's use of them in Millennium Actress with any more depth would be impossible without covering the film's third most prominent motif, the lotus, and why both the Japanese and Chinese poetic interpretations of this flower, as well as the crane, are an almost omnipresent staple of Millennium Actress's visual storytelling. It's tremendously difficult to overstate just how ubiquitous the lotus flower is throughout the East and the many cultures that have blossomed from it through the millennia. 
White lotuses were the symbol of ancient Upper Egypt. Blue lotuses of the Nile were used in their religious practices and exported to Greece, and it was there that their use as a sedative would be immortalized in Book 9 of the Odyssey. In Hinduism, the pink sacred lotus, or Padma, is associated with the gods Vishnu, Brahma, and Kubera, as well as the goddesses Lakshmi and Saraswati. And in Buddhism, it was believed that Gautama Buddha himself was born with the ability to walk, and with each step he took, a lotus flower bloomed underfoot. Its cultural and religious influence enduring for thousands of years and stretching over 6,000 miles? What makes the lotus so poetically resonant isn't its longevity, but its longevity. The lotus was so universally cherished, even to the ancient world, because it was known as a marvelously resilient and almost incomparably long-living flower. It was heavenly. Nearly every culture that witnessed the lotus as it bloomed came to almost the exact same poetic interpretation of it. Its roots, guarded deep within the beds of marshes and other murky waters, extended to the water's surface, allowing the flower itself to bloom untouched and unscathed by the darkness surrounding it. Moreover, it was theorized they could live for over 1,000 years, so the heavenly flower of the East came to represent purity and a long life. Some of the most prevalent Confucian scholars venerated its blooming as the expansion of the soul, referring to it as Junji for its purity, Chinese for gentleman or noble person. So the film opens on a lotus floating amidst a sea of black, and it blooms with Chiyoko's departure, purity and eternity. The vibrations of her launch manifest as an earthquake, another motif Cohn employs throughout the film, conducting us into the real world as it jostles Genya out of his chair, and away from the relative darkness most of Cohn's otaku dwell in. And we're afforded short glimpses of his disheveled and cluttered surroundings just before his camera operator, the designated comedic foil of the film, turns on the light. Another reflection. More than just being introduced as the deuteragonist of the film, we're introduced to Genya as an oddity within Satoshi Kon's work. See, Kon features otaku in everything. In Paranoia Agent, there are Masashi and Mitsuhiro. In Paprika, there are Tokita and Homuro. In Tokyo Godfathers, there is Sachiko. In Perfect Blue, there are Totokoro and Rumi. And in the case of Millennium Actress, there is Genya Tachibana. Except Millennium Actress just defied two of the biggest rules for Kon's otaku. Genya has a friend, and he has light. He possesses the longing gaze, the slovenly surroundings, and the unrequited love, but he doesn't stay in the darkness. So with his first 30 seconds of screen time, Genya establishes that his roots are in the same soil as Tadakoro's, but what has bloomed is the complete antithesis of him, a lotus. Shortly after this interaction, we learn that Genya is a director filming a documentary about Chiyoko's life, and this is all taking place decades after she's disappeared from acting. As we're reintroduced to Chiyoko, now well into her old age, we learn that not only is Genya's studio also named after lotuses, but it is named after lotuses specifically because Chiyoko adores them. So much so that upon mentioning she has a garden of them at her home, she asks Genya if he knows the poetic implications of their presence, to which he responds, Now, within this introductory sequence and Kone's transition from it to Chiyoko's memories, we're given a lot of information, and some of it isn't very pronounced. Both Chiyoko's acknowledgement that her, Genya, and whoever the key belong to can be represented by lotuses within this narrative, and Chiyoko basically telling us word for word that earthquakes will serve as a precursive motif throughout the film are pretty on the nose. But while these two things are happening, we're introduced to another motif, and Chiyoko kind of tells us the end of the film. In this shot, when Genya and his camera operator are still waiting for Chiyoko to begin their interview, a tapestry can be seen behind them for the first time. Only coming into view once Chiyoko's assistant mentions that Genya has something to give to Chiyoko. Fast forward roughly a minute and a half, and look, there it is again. And again, only shown to us while discussing the key. The tapestry is of a crane. More specifically, it's a red-crowned crane, otherwise known as a Manchurian crane. And these things are everywhere in Millennium Actress. In this following shot during the second earthquake, behind and on Chiyoko in her birth picture, on the side of Genya's semi, even indistinctly etched into the throne room wall. 
They are as common of a visual motif as lotuses are, and for good reason. They're poetically almost the same symbol. Both are omnipresent in the East as symbols of longevity and heaven. Both were believed to live for 1,000 years, and both were venerated as the highest nobility within their natural kingdoms, Junji. It's only when they're combined that their meaning is exalted. Two cranes walking or flying together among lotus flowers is basically the ultimate symbol of longevity, purity, and love within Chinese poetry. Simplified, it means pure love for an eternity. So Kohn explains the dynamic between Chiyoko, Genya, and the Man of the Key completely, that they're all in pursuit of love, one after the other, and will continue to live and die through this cycle for an eternity before we even see Chiyoko in her first film. And this is how Chiyoko tells us the ending. Her introduction to her life story, the beginning lines of her interview, are her noting that earthquakes are inexorably tied to her fate, specifying that it was during one of Japan's most violent that she was born. And just before this, in her present day introduction to us, her first words are not only an affirmation that the earthquake from earlier really happened, but a declaration from her that she was expecting to die from it. When Shioko learns that Genya's studio is named after the lotus, she specifies that the ones in her garden will be in bloom any day now. Now that we know lotuses are a predominant motif within the film, we can assume greater meaning can be assigned to this than Chiyoko simply making a gentle remark about her garden. And besides, weren't we chaperoned into the film by her departing from a flowering lotus? A lotus, when it blooms, symbolizes rebirth, the ending, and the paralleled new beginning of life. Chiyoko is going to die ever in pursuit of the man she's chasing, with Genya ever in pursuit behind her, as their interminable cycle begins its next revolution. And she just spelled it out for us in bold italics before we pass the 10 minute mark. Just as she does in her reintroduction to Genya, she does with her departure, telling him in thanks that she's going after her love again, as he pleads helplessly for her to stay, unable once more to declare how deep his love for her is before she leaves. Two longing gazes, and the reflection they're arrested within. What I adore so much about this film, and the reason I've spent so much time focusing on its visual motifs, is that Cone's use of color from Millennium Actress's first to last frame is planted firmly within these motifs as well. For the first over 40 minutes of the film, Chiyoko, Genya, and uh, I guess we'll call him Kibe, are never seen without either white or pink representing the lotus, or accoutrements of red representing the red-crowned crane. These flashes of symbolic warmth and purity made all the more prominent by the other pieces of their clothing and often even their surroundings being noticeably less saturated. But this all changes when the bombs drop. See, as much as I've focused on it thus far, this film isn't just a love story. It's a love letter. From Satoshi Kon to Japan. More than that, it's a love letter to Japanese cinema. To the great writers, set designers, DPs, producers, prop masters, directors, assistants, assistant directors, gaffers, grips, actors, actresses, etc., who not only endured throughout, but carried on after a war that completely decimated and reshaped their society. Chiyoko herself exists as a tribute to one of the greatest Japanese actresses to ever live, Setsuko Hara, and Millennium Actress manages to at once criticize its country of origin for the cruelties it visited upon others and comfort its people for the cruelties visited upon them. The primary antagonist of the film, referred to in its credits simply as the man with the scar, maneuvers through much of Millennium Actress as an amalgamation of the barbarous imperial forces that had carried out immeasurable cruelties against its enemies and its own people in the name of Emperor Hirohito. Kibe, despite it being made abundantly clear that he was of no physical threat to the Japanese Empire, was fervently pursued and later tortured and murdered for the crime of opposing their ethics and their claim over China. 
A charge countless people were faced with for supporting the rebellions of Manchukuo both before and during the Second Sino-Japanese War, and one that meant execution if you were a man, or being forced into sex slavery until you were beaten to death, died of untreated STDs, or slowly and painfully lost your life to internal bleeding, oftentimes due to forced miscarriages, if you were a woman under the rule of an emperor who hand-signed 375 separate authorizations to use chemical weapons during the Battle of Wuhan alone. A military leadership that from the start of World War II to its end was responsible for the enslavement and rape of over 200,000 women, 90% of which were dead by the end of the war. Political leaders responsible for the Nanking Massacre of China and the Manila Massacre of the Philippines. A hyper-nationalist elite that had engineered bombs encased with bubonic plague, cholera, smallpox, botulism, and anthrax, planned to be dropped on San Diego, California just five weeks after their eventual surrender. For this part of Japan's history, Kone not only condenses and then projects this callousness through the man with the scar, but later reveals his guilt as well. His meek apology, not just to Chiyoko, but to humanity, framed by the Empire-approved Bunka Iga of her past and her sullen dismissal of the man who once threw her into political prison, framed by her post-war films, representing the miraculous resilience of the Japanese civilians to pioneer a cultural and ideological renaissance of Japanese cinema in the wake of the destruction that brought about this war's conclusion. But the man with the scar and the empire he acted on behalf of are not the only ones due for an apology. This shot is the first time in the entire film where we see Chiyoko surrounded exclusively in cold and neutral colors. In this moment, standing in the aftermath of what would seem to her or anyone else in her shoes like the destruction of the entire world, picking through the rubble of the only thing her family had left to leave her, Chiyoko feels almost lifeless. For this brief window of time, there is no love to pursue, no comfort to be found, and no soaring strings or elated piano melodies to accompany the movements if there were. Within these few cuts live some of the longest, most static shots in the entire film. This is pain, as striking and sincere as the destruction around her is senseless. I'm writing this on August 21st, 2018. I was born a few hours north of where the Japanese bombs would have dropped. I'm American, and 12 days ago, a bomb built and sold by my country killed 40 children in a school bus in Yemen. We are not, and have never been, excused from the practice of cruelty. This suspension of Chiyoko's pursuit and its visual disconnect from the rest of the film is, to me, the most poignant and sobering moment that Kohn ever composed. It affords us the opportunity to witness the other side of the coin the man with a scar resides in the face of. From the January of 1944 until the following August of 1945, the United States dropped 157,000 tons of bombs on Japanese cities. Before the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the US had already killed 333,000 Japanese and wounded another 473,000 from air raids alone. And following the nuclear attacks, this death toll rose to at least 470. 60,000. 15 million Japanese citizens were left homeless. U.S. soldiers viciously carried out 1,336 reported rapes in only their first 10 days of occupying Kanagawa following the Japanese surrender. As many as 10,000 women were raped by U.S. soldiers in Okinawa alone, and roughly 60% of the Japanese soldiers killed on the Mariana Islands were missing their skulls. The United States imprisoned 120,000 of its own people for the crime of having at least 1 16th Japanese blood and living in a country that has routinely decided since its inception that its citizens are not as important as fear-mongering and racist political bias, while abroad our military treaded through its conflicts with a zealous hatred for the people they fought. 
the United States from the perspective of a civilian in Japan would seem no more like a liberating force for good than a hammer would to a nail. 68 US civilians died in the attack of Pearl Harbor, but over 100,000 Japanese civilians died when we bombed Tokyo. Regardless of who incited the conflict or which side committed more war crimes, with this momentary stillness, Satoshi demands of us only what we should demand of ourselves, to be morally consistent. To not only wag our finger at the imperial officer, but to acknowledge that the transgressions of the rulers he served do not exonerate the crimes of who they fought. And through this rebalanced lens, throughout the remainder of this sequence and the one following it, as Chiyoko explains why she and her studio continue to create films in the heart of such loss, Cohn exalts and eulogizes the filmmakers that 70 years later we still revere as some of the most talented artists to ever stand on a set. Names like Yamamoto, Ozu, Kurosawa, Naruse, Imamura, and Mizuguchi, whose immeasurable talent and influence still echo through the medium today. Slowly, the color returns to Chiyoko's life, and we see her enveloped by the colors of the lotus and the red-crowned crane once more, never again letting go of her love even after his appearance begins to elude her memory and she compromises for the deceitful words of another. And although this forgetfulness in terms of Kibe's appearance distresses Chiyoko, it nonetheless galvanizes the reason she fell in love with him to begin with. His appearance isn't important, either to her or the narrative. If anything, what makes his appearance important is that it's completely indistinct, even to the woman who spends her entire life chasing after him. What sincerely matters about him, the singular trait that has always and will always make her endless pursuit worth it, is what he pursues. An ideal. One that is at once both unattainable and inextinguishable. Peace. Humanity's inherent disposition to favor love over strife. And I couldn't imagine a better character to attribute such a timeless ideal to. A man we know nothing about outside of his beliefs and the color he's always crowned by. Throughout the remaining leg of the film, Chiyoko discovers her betrayal at the hands of Eiko and Utaki, and the now faint flame that had propelled her ever towards Kibe is rekindled as an inferno. Her desperate break for Hokkaido to find him mirroring what Eiko had just cited as the cause of her years of muted resentment. Chiyoko's pursuit of love kept her young. As she darts through rainy streets and across snowy train platforms, Kone not only gives us a visual reflection to Aiko's metaphorical expression, but he does so with what is the most impressive sequence of transitions I've ever seen. And it lasts nine minutes. Leaping effortlessly between millennia of Japanese history and decades of Japanese cinema, the characters that Chiyoko once played and the eras she once visited harmonize into a single consonant tone. And as she finally approaches the painting described to her so many years ago as a young girl in late 30s Japan, the earth once again shakes us from this fantasy and causes Chiyoko to once again face the closest thing to a secondary antagonist this film has to offer, her own fear. Based on a Japanese Mukashi Banashi, a once beautiful princess named Kiyohime turned jealous demon when the priest she loves loses interest in her and flees, the old woman Chiyoko encounters that periodically reappears until the end of the film is neither an aspect of the film she carried with her or an actual demon triggering various calamities to stand in the way of her pursuit. Rather, she's just a reflection. A folktale that was very popular during the Edo period where the film was based, and an amalgam of what she never wants to but subconsciously fears she'll someday become. Old and embittered, her once fiery heart having withered with age into the smoldering coals of envy and loneliness. And the thousand year tea she coaxes her into drinking is not some mystical curse, it's just lotus tea, hence the name. With the last flash of her reflection, the old woman faintly and cheerlessly responding to Chiyoko for the flame and the youth of heart she still possessed, the last earthquake of Millennium Actress ushers us in to Chiyoko's final moments. 
Genya, again pleading in vain with her not to keep running, and Chiyoko again reassuring him that she'll be okay, with a bittersweet thank you and cheerful goodbye. Her once brilliant and unrestrained theme, composed by Susumu Hirasawa, now pacified to the gentle hum of a piano. And as Kone and Murai complete their fold on Millennium Actress's vertical axis, as its sunrise becomes its sunset and its end rotates back into its beginning, Chiyoko departs from the same lotus, soaring towards us and the great beyond, her last words echoing through a sea of stars as an abridged Aesop of the film itself. Millennium Actress is a gleaming, phosphorescent reflection of its sister, Perfect Blue. The dynamic, starry compositions of Susumu Hirasawa, and the boundless love put into its screenplay by Murai and Kone, its brilliant editing, its both devastating and uplifting social commentary, its use of Japanese and Chinese poetic symbolism often overlapping one another to not only express Kone's distaste for the contentious imperialism of Japan's recent past, but to illustrate the unity between their two kingdoms, the absence of love suffered by Chiyoko's mother and the man with the scar, the loss of love endured by Aiko and Utaki, the pursuit of love that Genya, Chiyoko, and Kibe are destined to forever return to, and the possession of love that Murai and Kone themselves have not just for their country, but for its breathtakingly rich cinematic history, all coalesce and compress themselves into a luminous and earnestly composed record, one that when played cries out as loudly as it can for the love of cinema, for the love of peace and for the love of love itself. Maybe it doesn't matter if the chase ends. In all of its arrangements and articulations, no matter how grand or slight its scope, and no matter how perilous its context, love itself is the only thing worth running in the name of. And I agree, because when I was young, I was in love with love. And I still am. the night it's a beautiful night and we call it a bella notte look at the sky hey Thank you so much for watching my snappy uh, video here. I hope you enjoyed it at least half as much as I did making it. Big, 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 tremendous thank you to my patrons for making these vids possible. Look at their pretty little names flying by. Anyways, if you feel like helping me make more slick vids like the one you just watched, consider becoming a patron. Uh, every little bit helps me make this thing a full-time gig. Subscribe, please, and let me know what you thought about what I thought down below, uh, or on Twitter. Love you, love you, love you. Have a good night.